So this is the bonus lesson for Yori 300. Now Yori 300, of course, is the first upper division course in the Yori series. And we've been talking about temperaments, we've been talking about making change, we've been talking about you know, all of the, the infinite dimensions of human beings and personality. And so in this bonus lesson, rather than deriving what is essentially like a lesson you know, 9A or a, a legit lesson 10, we're going to kind of change direction a little bit, but within the theme of its upper division. Within the theme of, let's, let's dive into something pretty profound. Let's dive into something that might even be a little challenging. Now, it does fit with the part that, you know, we are all infinitely complex. It does fit in with the part of making change and looking for things in ourselves to change. Because as we continue to learn, as we continue to grow, when we're born, of course, learning and growing is pretty much governed by society around us. We, we learn how to talk, we learn how to walk. But then we also don't realize sometimes how much we learn our emotional patterns, how much we learn our verbal patterns, how much we learn our interactive patterns, and how much we practice those as we grow up. And we continue to practice an, an older, more sophisticated version as we get older. So I'm in my 50s now, and when I kind of look around the world around me, I see people around my age, 40s, 50s, and 60s, that are essentially doing a sophisticated version of an adolescent behavior. And as we do these sophisticated versions, we believe that we're doing things in a mature way, we're at least doing things in a well-rehearsed, well-practiced way, we're doing things in a way we, we rationalize, which means we make it sound rational, we make it sound logical to do it this way. Things that we justify, which means that we try to make it sound just, we try to make it sound like it's a right thing to do, or at the very least it's not a wrong thing to do. But here is the lesson. And this is based on an essay that I wrote that's been used in a number of contexts from uh, blog posts to discussion starters to uh, lecture notes. And the idea is simple. Do not argue for a proposition where winning your point means you lose everything that's really important to you. So I'm going to say that again because if you didn't get that down or you didn't hear that clearly, I won't really want you to do that. So I'm going to say it, say it a couple of more times. Do not argue for a proposition where... Winning your point means you lose everything that's really important to you. And then one more time all the way through, if you want to check and make sure you wrote that down right or you heard that right, do not argue for a proposition where winning your point means you lose everything that is really important to you. And there's several versions of this. Now, the... The one that emotionally is a little distant so that when we hear it, we can really hear it, we can understand it better, is a story that I use to illustrate a lot of things. So when I was a kid, I'd make stupid mistakes. Why? Because I was a kid. Kids make stupid mistakes because they're kids. They don't know any better. Stupid kids make stupid mistakes. Smart kids make stupid mistakes. It doesn't really matter. Kids make stupid mistakes because they're kids. So... What if when I made one of those stupid mistakes, my mom, who very frequently would bear witness to said mistakes, said, Scotty, what is wrong with you? What the hell is wrong with you, kid? Why are you so stupid? You're such an idiot. So then what would her proposition be? She would be arguing a proposition that there's something wrong with her son. She'd be arguing the proposition that there's something the hell wrong with her son. She'd be arguing the proposition that her son is stupid, and she would be arguing the proposition her son is an idiot. Now, suppose she would convince her son. Suppose I grew up believing I'm stupid, believing I'm an idiot, believing there's something wrong with me, believing that there's something the hell wrong with me. Is she going to get more of the behavior she hopes for? Or is she going to get more of the behavior that she doesn't like? Because if I believe I'm stupid, will there be more stupid stuff or less stupid stuff? There'll be more. That's going to be consistent with my sense of my own identity. That if I believe 
there's something the hell wrong with me, is she going to get more good behavior or more bad behavior? She's going to get more bad behavior because how does a brain work if there's something the hell wrong with it? Not even just not exactly right, but the hell wrong with it. She would get messed up behavior. And what if she doesn't even manage to convince me, or she does manage to convince me, but the thing that I really learn is my mother thinks I'm a stupid idiot and there's something that hung wrong with me. Will I go to someone who believes I'm a stupid idiot with something wrong with me when I need help? No. She would alienate her son and possibly convince me of an identity she really wouldn't want me to have anyway. Now, fortunately, my mother was much wiser than that. My mother was much more loving than that. She was grounded in love and grounded in a simple common sense wisdom that dictated that the identity of her son is incongruent with the stupid things I did. That the stupid things I did did not match up with who she saw her son to be. So instead, she would say something like, why would a smart kid like you do such a stupid thing? Well, now that's a confusing question. Like, why would a stupid kid do a stupid thing? Well, a stupid kid, stupid thing. I don't know why you're confused. But smart kid, stupid thing. There's like an incongruence there. And when you get that kind of incongruence, there's a, a neurolinguistic programming term they use for that called trancing. What it basically means is when your brain's confused, it has this moment where it can't figure it out and is looking for an answer. And so then my mother at that time would say, you just didn't think about it, did you? Well, that, that makes sense. Smart kid, stupid thing, didn't, must not have thought about it. That makes perfect sense. I'll go with that one. Yes, that's true. I didn't think about it. So what does a smart kid do when they realize they're doing a stupid thing? Well, you could ask the kids I've taught this to in my martial arts class, and they'll tell you, you stop! Because you're not supposed to be doing it in the first place. And that's what you do. You stop. Because you're not supposed to be doing it in the first place. That's all you do. Smart kid, stupid thing. Smart kid realizes it's a stupid thing. And so he stops. Because he realizes he's not supposed to be doing it in the first place. Very simple, right? So my mother, without realizing it, was a neurolinguistic programming master practitioner. Because really a lot of uh, NLP boils down to it's, it's psychological common sense in many cases. Now there's a lot of really, really advanced, sophisticated techniques that's really important to understand that kind of dives into a level of applied psychology that obviously we're not going to go into here. But a lot of it is pretty common sense. A lot of it, when you learn it, you go, oh, well, yeah, that makes sense. That makes perfect sense. And this is one of them. So again, do not argue for a proposition where winning your point means you lose everything that's really important to you. So what proposition did my mother make? She made the proposition, Scotty, you're smart. You are a smart kid, proposition. Thing was stupid, proposition. Smart kid, stupid thing. Does that go together? No, that does not go together, proposition. So she convinces me I'm a smart kid, and she convinces me it's a stupid thing. What do smart kids do about stupid things? They stop. But what if she convinced me I was stupid? What if she convinced me that at least she believed I was stupid? Because everything she would get, every time she get emotionally passionate, all of a sudden I'm stupid. And then what I would learn is, oh, Mom's emotion goes up, my intelligence goes down. And then I would begin to figure, okay, mom's emotion goes up, and then she says that I'm stupid. Is that when she's being the most honest? Does she always believe I'm stupid? It's just that when she's not emotional, she knows better than to actually say it out loud, but that's really what she thinks. Which often tends to be how we view people's angry, passionate statements. That the angry, angrier they get, the more they drop their filters. 
the more they drop their social filters, the more they drop their, their calculations, and the more openly, honestly raw they are being in the middle of that emotion. And that tends to be part of how we interpret things. At the very least, it's definitely how we remember things because emotion connects to memory. So that whole smart kid proposition, well, now she wins that proposition. She gets everything that she wants. Now she's got a smart kid. Now she's got a smart kid who understands that when he does something stupid, it's because he didn't stop long enough to think first. She's developing a smart kid who understands wisdom 101 is think first. And that if this smart kid will just think first, this smart kid will do smart stuff because that's what smart kids do. If she wins her proposition, she gets this idea when the smart kid realizes the thing he's doing is stupid, the smart kid will stop doing the stupid thing because the smart kid knows stupid is incongruent with being smart. <coughs> so she actually argued for a proposition where winning her point got her everything that was most important to her. Now, we see this proposition arguing in married couples, too. Now, my mother was an incredibly wise mother. She wasn't always quite so wise as a wife, because one of the things she would do in the, the peak of argument sometimes is she'd scream, I want a divorce! So, proposition. I want a divorce. Well, then you go, well, what triggers that proposition, but whatever issue the argument is based on. So the proposition as stated very intensely and in this raw, open, honest way is that this issue is bigger to me than the existence of our marriage. And that if you want to know how big and how important and how vital this whole relationship is and this whole status is, Look at the issue. The marriage, the relationship, the love that we have is smaller than that issue. Well, my father told me one time that, you know, he heard my mother say that one time too many. And there was one particular day, and he couldn't even tell me which one it was, that he heard her say, I want a divorce! And he was about to open his mouth to argue, and something inside him just said, okay. And he was done. Up until then, the two of them would just fight over stuff. And when he was done, she was done. Now, the fact that she would make that statement again and again and again kind of told her at some level, some part of her inside herself had been done for a while. Because that's where that statement comes from. And what ended up happening is there was an argument for a proposition where the point was won. And so much of what was important to them was lost. But congratulations, you won your point. Now my mother has since learned better. I haven't heard her say that Hardly at all to her second husband, my stepfather. And the two of them have now been married many, many, many more years than my mother and my father were married. And, that, and they get along great. She's, she's really learned a lot, as you would expect, because, you know, she was much older. So you figure if I was 20 when she was born, or when I, oh yeah, she was 20 when I was born. Obviously she wasn't 20 when she was born then she's kind of figuring this out you know, through her teens when she got married, which back then wasn't at all unusual. Through her 20s, when she's also raising two kids, and into her 30s. But then as she got into her 40s and her 50s, her 60s, and now her 70s, she has obviously grown up, obviously grown much more mature, obviously grown much, much more insightful. 
and that she continues to learn and she continues to improve. And every once in a while, she'll uh, suggest to me that she's still trying to decide what she wants to be when she grows up. But this idea, we see it in marriage a lot too. That when we get upset, a lot of people tend to take it out on our spouses. Not with our spouses, that would be totally okay. But on our spouses. Now, what taking something out with a spouse might mean is that it sounds like partnership. It might be emotionally intense, but the scripting sounds like partnership. Or I might be really upset over stuff going on outside, and there's no attacks on the partner. So, like, I, I just had a, a simple, tiny little thing happen today. I lost my wallet. And uh, what had happened is I realized last night, I, I just got back from out of town. So last night I went and bought groceries to kind of stock up the fridge. And while I was there, just, I don't know, half an hour before closing, I left my wallet. Well, I went back, but they were already closed and they were already gone. So there's nobody there to, to check and see if there was a wallet. And then I'm without my wallet. Now suppose I'm married and I go home and I start taking it out on my spouse. And you go, oh, honey! Like, what's going on? And then she, whoa, whoa, whoa. Hey, so I'm not the one that left your wallet. Like, what do you mean? Are you calling me? So, that'd be taking me out on her. But if I go back and say, oh, honey, I left my wallet at the store. I still had errands. I wanted to run. Oh. And then she can give me a hug. And I'm like, oh, I get so frustrated sometimes when I do that. I still needed to go to Walmart. I still needed to go pick up some more things. Now I'm going to have to do that tomorrow. Okay, that's taking it out with her. That she can tell I'm upset, or she can tell that I'm frustrated, or tell that you know, whatever the emotion is. And she can clearly tell none of it is directed at her. All of it is directed out. And then that way she knows it's safe to come close and offer comfort. If, on the other hand, what she learns is Scott gets upset, Scott attacks wife. What I'm teaching my wife is, whenever I'm upset about anything, whether it's something that I did, whether it's something that she did, whether it's something that someone else did, I am not safe. And that if she can, it might be a good idea to leave the house, or at least try to hide in another room, and hope that I don't take it out on her. And to kind of walk on eggshells and hope that she doesn't say a wrong word, or a word I might interpret wrong, or she doesn't do a wrong thing, or something I might interpret wrong, or she doesn't misspeak, or, you know, and then just to be on eggshells and then hope I don't take it out on her. Now, is that the way I want to live with a partner? Of course not. But we do stuff like this. Now, sometimes when it's our spouse that messes up, and, and why do spouses mess up? Because spouses are people, and people mess up. Kind of like, you know, stupid thing, kid. Kids do stupid things. Why? Because they're kids. People make mistakes. Why do people make mistakes? Because people are human. And you have a guaranteed lack of perfection with all humans. So sometimes when we get upset, we'll take it out on our spouses. We'll call them names. We will fight to diagnose a mental illness. Or at least something that used to be in the DSM. Like when you know, someone's not being you know, totally angry about something or they're focused on you know, getting something that they want for some reason and, and someone will try to diagnose them with malignant narcissism. And I said, why are you diagnosing me with malignant narcissism? Well, you're only worried about yourself and all you kids. Like, I just got back from a cruise and I'm planning my next vacation. Yeah, all you care about is yourself and that, that's malignant narcissism. And I said, like, okay, so you are diagnosing me with a mental illness for planning a vacation. Or if you know, someone goes off on anything like that. Or if someone is, you know, perhaps misremembering something. It's like, well, you have a histrionic disorder. It's like, well, you're being so emotional. You're obviously bipolar. And then when we start to do things like that, we are ascribing a permanent identity of something wrong, kind of like the thing we're talking about with my mother. 
if, if she was arguing that there's something wrong with you, not just wrong with you, but the hell wrong with you. Not only the hell wrong with you, but diagnosably labelable. And that's who you are. That is the truth and the reality about you. So suppose we convince them of whatever terrible name that we call them. Suppose we convince them that they have these terrible motives, and that's really what it's coming from. What if we convince them that they are truly the villain in our life? That they are the reason we have these problems. They are the reason we are so upset. If I win that point, what do I get? What's my outcome? What if we convince them that they're legitimately crazy? Or that they are legitimately suffering from some specific mental disorder? Some specific mental illness? And we convince them. And so now they start behaving congruent with the identity they have now accepted for themselves. Whether they become convinced that they must really secretly be harboring these evil motives, and that really must be where they're coming from, because, I mean, you know, this is my wife, or this is my husband, and, and you know, this is the person who lives with me all the time, and that if anybody would know, they're the ones that would know, and maybe I really am this terrible, evil person, and, and they become convinced that they're this terrible, evil person, are we going to get more wonderful, good behavior? Or are we going to get more terrible, evil behavior? What if they actually do become the villain in our lives because we have convinced them they are the villain in our lives? Well, chances are, we lose. We lose the things that are really important to us. We won that point, congratulations, you won. But you lost the bigger picture. You lost the big thing. You lost what was really important to you. Now, related to that, whether we convince them or not, what if we manage to convince them that we believe it? So what if I convince you that I think you are a terrible human being? What if I convince you that I really do honestly think you're crazy? What if I convince you that I believe that, you, that the reality of your motives are coming from this evil place? What if I convince you that I really do see you as the villain in any drama that unfolds in my life that includes you? And you begin to see whether you think it's true or not, especially if you don't think it's true. If you believe that you're fundamentally a good person who loves me and who really wants the best for this relationship and is doing his best or her best in whatever the relationship is, whether it's a business relationship, whether it's a co-worker, employee, employer, whether it's an instructor to student relationship, whether it's a friendship, a romance, whatever it is. But it begins to sink into you, even just think about it as my student, that your instructor thinks that you're an evil, terrible, villainous person. Do you keep going to that school? That this one particular friend among your friends thinks you're a terrible, crazy, evil villain. Do you go out of your way to spend time with that friend? That this family member thinks that you're a terrible, crazy, evil villain. That your boyfriend or your girlfriend or your husband or your wife really seems to believe you are a terrible, crazy, evil villain. And that when they're calm, they never talk that way. When they're calm, they profess their love. Whenever they think they might actually lose you, they profess their love and their devotion. But some part of you realize that every time you get upset, the first place you automatically go is terrible, crazy, evil villain. So obviously that's always running in the background because boy does that show up fast. And so how much of this purported love that you say that you have, this respect and this honor and all of this other stuff, really is you liking what I do for you? You liking that I'm a student in your class and I'm paying you money? Or you, know, you liking that I'm you know, teaching you really cool stuff? Or you liking you know, all the stuff I do for you in the house, that you know, I, I cook your meals and I do your laundry? Or are you liking the fact that I'm your paycheck? 
or you liking that you want this job. And that it's, it, it's a calculation and that you're putting up with terrible, crazy, evil villain because there's practical things you want to keep and you don't want to lose those things. Or that you're neurotic about being alone. That you, you, know, you don't want to lose another karate instructor. You don't want to lose another student. You don't want to lose another job. You don't want to lose another boyfriend. You don't want to lose another girlfriend. You don't want to lose a wife. You don't want to lose a husband. You don't want to be by yourself. You don't want to have to start over. And that's really what it's about because you really seem to believe I'm a terrible, crazy, evil villain. <clears throat> what does a healthy person do when you're with someone who believes you're a terrible, crazy, evil villain? Do you build space into that relationship or do you build intimacy into that relationship? Do you put up your guard or do you drop your guard? Do you armor up or do you drop your armor? Do you put walls between you and them or do you drop your walls between you and them? There are some mandatory relationships, commonly uh, children and parents or siblings, where you really don't have a choice. Where honestly the most loving thing you can do is every time you're around these people is guard up, armor up, Walk on the eggshells, hide in your fortress, maintain as much distance as you can. And that really can be sometimes the most loving thing you can do because the person is toxic. And you can't get away from the relationship. But what if we could flip all of that? So imagine, instead of all the nasty arguments that we might make, we argue the proposition that they're a wonderful partner. We argue the proposition that this horrible mistake is a shock because they're a wonderful partner. What if we actually put issues in context of the larger relationship? What if I'm married and I have a wife who, who makes a legit mistake. It's not just a matter of interpretation. It's not something that I should have taken part or full responsibility for. It's not something we should have been working together. So it's totally not on me at all. It's 100% on her. But because of guaranteed lack of perfection, mistakes will be made. And the mistake got made. So what if the mistake that she made, the thing she did wrong, speaks to a lack of love, a lack of honoring, and that it seems like it's a violation, maybe even a betrayal, of something that she had agreed to do. But then, you know, it just dropped out of her head. And I'm sitting around, and instead of calling her names, instead of diagnosing her with a mental illness, instead of accusing her, Instead of demanding a divorce, we say, honey, that really hurts. So I know you love me. I know you honor me. I know you mean well. I know that you're doing your best. I really needed this done. And it's not being done hurts. Because it's so unlike you. Is that a different argument? That is a very different argument. It's like we have this thing going on. Instead of arguing for her to be the villain, I argue from the start for her to be the hero. Like, honey, I count on you for things like that. What can we do to fix it? So suppose it's me and I'm angry, and in the middle of being angry, I still make all of these loving declarations. I might be so furious that I'm shouting, there's so much anger, there's so much intensity. But in the middle of shouting, I'm shouting, and like, I know you love me. I know you honor me. This feels all backwards. If even in my Fury, I am affirming the best things about her. 
if even in my fury when I'm sharing my devastation over something, I'm declaring the best things about her, I'm declaring the best things about the relationship. I'm declaring that I believe that she loves me, I believe that she wants the best for me. And that's why this hurts so much. What if I win that proposition? Proposition, she loves me. Proposition, she honors me. Proposition, she wants the best for me. Proposition, I am married to a magnificent woman. Proposition, we are a great partnership. Proposition, your husband is hurting. Proposition, your husband is angry. And proposition, your husband needs you to be the hero in his life. What if I win all of my propositions? So I've referred to this a couple of times, hero, villain, victim. So if we want to simplify it to a simple core proposition, that when stuff happens, there's a victim. When problems strike, there's a victim. So when I lost my wallet last night, there was a victim, me. I lost my wallet. My wallet's gone. I'm a victim. Now, who is the villain? <coughs> goodness, pardon me. So who was the villain? Well, I was the villain because I was the one who left my wallet. Who's the hero? Well, I'm the hero because I'm going to go get my wallet. And so I am all three positions simultaneously. But when we get in arguments with friends, colleagues, romantic partners, family members, spouses, we have a tendency to want to argue, they're the villain, I'm the victim. And then that's the fundamental proposition. You're the bad guy in this. You're the villain. It's bad because of you. So, I make the argument that I'm the victim. Suppose I win that proposition, I'm the victim. I win the argument, you are the villain. You're the bad guy in this. So now you realize you're the villain. You're the villain, I'm the victim. Who's the hero? Well, here gets to be the interesting thing. Because in the process of arguing that you're the villain, what's the next thing I'm going to demand is I'm going to demand that the villain be my hero. Meaning I want you to solve it. You go, now wait a second. I just spent all of this emotional energy, this intellectual energy to convince you you're the villain. And now I'm asking you to take off the black hat and put on the white hat after I basically just glued that black hat onto your head. What in the world am I thinking? I am arguing the proposition that you are the evil in my life. And once I get done arguing that you're the joker, now I want you to be Batman. Once I get done arguing that you're Lex Luthor, now I want you to be Superman. Like, my whole argument has been you're the bad guy. And now I expect the bad guy to fix it. Bad guys don't tend to not fix things. Heroes fix things. Villains break things. Villains do damage. Heroes create repair. Heroes and villains are fundamentally opposed to one another. Why would I argue that you are the villain if what I really want is you to be the hero? So again, do not argue for a proposition. Where winning your point means you lose everything that's really important to you. Now, of course, obviously, as illustrated with the, the simplicity of the wallet, we can totally be our own hero. Sometimes it's all self-contained, it's not that big of a deal. Something as simple as the wallet, got forgot. Now I'm the victim of not having a wallet. 
Why am I the victim of not having a wallet? Because I forgot my wallet. But that's okay. I'm going to be the hero. I'm going to be the one that's going to go get my wallet. But a lot of times when bad stuff happens, we'll take a self-defense situation where some criminal decides to target me. Okay, criminal is a villain. I'm the victim. Can I step up and be my own hero? Of course, that's what we do for self-defense. We train to be the hero. Self-defense means I'm the victim, I'm going to be my own hero. But will I expect a criminal who's attacking me to be my hero? Of course not. He's the one creating the problem in the first place. He's the villain. And he's the villain on purpose, not inadvertently like me forgetting my wallet. So if I willfully hid my wallet at the store, that's being a willful villain. I just forgot it. That's an oops. But if someone had taken my wallet, that'd be a willful villain. So suppose I'm arguing with my partner and I'm accusing my partner of being the villain. So what am I doing? I'm claiming victim status. I'm arguing for my partner to be the villain. Well, I can't argue then for my partner to be the hero. What if instead I argued the role of hero from the start? What if instead I argued for my partner to be my hero from the start? What if I argued from the very start that she is the solution to my problem rather than she is my problem? That she is the one that I count on and she is the one I will partner with. And I will also continue to understand this idea of guaranteed lack of perfection. None of us is going to get it 100%. I don't want to be held to a 100% standard, so obviously I'm not going to hold someone else to a 100% standard because that would be ridiculous, right? 95% is a solid A in almost any academic you know, course you could take. So if I argue the hero role for her, I might still argue I'm the victim, and I want to be hero in my own life, and so there are going to be partner heroes here. And that the villain is the problem itself. We have person, person, problem. I'm not wielding the problem as a weapon against my partner. I'm partnering with my partner to go against the problem. The problem is the enemy. My partner is my hero. And we will be heroes hand in hand to overcome this problem. Now what if there's a pattern of behavior? But the biggest cause for a pattern of behavior is when the other or both of us keeps expecting one the other or both of us to not be who they are. So if I keep for expecting you to not forget things when I know you forget things. Certainly, if you keep expecting me to not forget things when you know I forget things when I, when I just got done telling you I forgot my wallet last night, would you be surprised if, I'm, if I can forget something as significant and emotionally important to me as my wallet when I still have errands to run? Do you figure that if you asked to borrow a DVD from me that I might possibly forget the DVD later on? Of course. And so you craft a system to solve the problem. Why? Because we are partners, not opponents. We are partners in overcoming the problem. And I have zero interest in casting you as a villain. Now, here gets to be part of a mindset thing. If every time I get upset, I want to find a villain. If every time something goes wrong, I want you to be the bad guy. Because some, something in my brain says, if you're the bad guy, then I'm the victim. And that means I'm okay, I'm just victimized. And that everything that goes wrong in my life isn't my fault. I don't have to be my own hero. So I don't have to take any responsibility, and I can claim to have no power. Now, since we've been talking about temperaments for this whole thing, you know, I have a powerful, playful temperament. And positive powerfuls hate to have no power. So positive powerfuls want to find their fault in things because I can fix what's my fault. Positive powerfuls want to find their power because they want to have some control over outcomes. Powerful positive or positive powerfuls hate situations where there really literally is nothing they can do.
We hate that. That's what bugs us probably more than anything. And so we seek out our power. And so the whole proposition of being the victim with no power, just like, ugh, that, that, that's sickening. It, it just creates this, like, ear feeling that, that just permeates every cell and molecule of our, our mind and our body. And so we're constantly looking for something that we can do. Something we can do to produce the outcome. We hate the idea that something is entirely someone else's fault. Because whatever is entirely someone else's fault means we lost a core value. Our power. Our ability to influence our own lives. So for positive powerfuls, this is a really easy thing to do because it, that exact thing if we're looking for our power. So if I argue the role of the hero from the start, you're never the villain in my life, you're the hero in my life. You're never the reason that went wrong, you're the way we are going to solve it. I'm not interested in punishing you, I'm interested in allying with you. And if you willfully choose or are unable to partner with me, okay, then we can end it. But I would really like to have my partner. I've had this with students probably, I don't know, half a dozen times over the course of training where a student messes up in a way that they think is going to get them kicked out. Now, I have had students who messed up and I have demoted them. I have had students mess up in ways that I have asked them to leave. But the more common thing, if someone's a good student, if they're improving, if they're learning, they're gaining insight, they're gaining wisdom, they're aimed in a good direction, but they're still rather inculcated in all the stuff that they learned out in the world and in their own history. My much more common response isn't, well, you have to leave because you're not the perfect student. It's more, you need to be here and you need to learn this stuff and you need to practice this stuff and you need to live out this philosophy. And so far, every single time that I can remember off the top of my head, the student has been shocked. They expected punitive. They expected you're bad. And instead what they got is be better. Instead, what they got is, you're better than this. I expect you to show me you're better than this. You learn this stuff. And you do it, and you do it right. Be better. And I don't know how much that impacts their day-to-day -day life. Hopefully, it impacts the way they interact with other people. And so we argue that we want it to stop. Not a partner to stop. That the problem behavior is the enemy. The person is the hero. They're the one who's going to go to battle against the villain to stop the victimization. They are the partner that is going to partner with me to solve that problem. And if I win that proposition, I get everything that's important to me. So if I get furious with my spouse, if I get furious with a business partner, they will hear affirming words. They will hear the exact same words I am likely to say in celebration. When I'm dealing with a business partner that has failed me again, I don't attack them as bad. I may question them. It's like, look, I am learning. I can't trust you with things like this. So we need to craft a system that will take care of this for us. A big one for me is learning vocabulary. When someone says, yep, yeah, I've got it totally taken care of. You can count on me. Well, if I say, got it totally taken care of, you can count on me, you know what that means? It means I've got it, it's totally taken care of, and you can count on me. What I've been learning is those other people where they say, got it 
totally taking care of it, you can count on me. What they really mean is right here, right now, in the split second I'm uttering these words, I have the best of intentions. But in 20 seconds, I might have zero recollection of anything I just said or what you just asked me to do. And if there is no follow-up, you can figure 50-50 chance I will completely forget to do the thing I just said I would do. And so with certain individuals, I learn, okay, I'll do an immediate follow-up and say, okay, this is what we have agreed to. At a business meeting yesterday, I've already had two follow-ups. Where we had the meeting, immediately after the meeting, I followed up with one key piece of information in his fast action. Why? Is it because he's not that bright? Oh, he's brilliant. Is it that he might forget? Absolutely he might forget. And then later on today, I'll do a more thorough follow-up that will explain my understanding of our agreements in our discussion. So that he knows what I heard, and he knows what I think we agreed to. Now, chances are, him being him, he'll look and go, oh yeah, I forgot we talked about that part. And there'll be like, in five points, there might be two of them that has been, oh yeah, oh yeah, that's right, I forgot that we, we talked about that. And the other three go, oh yeah, well, of course, you, know, you, don't, you, you don't need to remind me. Or once he sees it, his brain recognizes it, goes, oh yeah, of course. But if I didn't follow up, he'd remember three of the five. And so I know this. So what do you do? You follow up in writing. Now some people have noted, but that doesn't always work. Of course not. Does anything always work? What's funny is the people who will argue that this doesn't always work, are the same people who will argue for propositions where winning their point destroys everything they want. It's like, so does the one you're using always get you the outcome that you want? Is it getting you the quality of life that you want? Is it getting you the quality of relationship you want? Does it work for you on an every time basis? And almost always the answer I get is, well, no. It's like, then why is your argument on this one that doesn't always work? Well, what it really boils down to is because I feel bad that I don't already do it that way. And part of it for me is like, well, would you feel good if you started doing it that way? Well, well, yeah, I just wish that I always did. And, and when did you learn this? If you learned this today, can you do yesterday what you learned today? Like, can you go back, to, you know, 10 years ago and try to teach yourself how to use a piece of software that just came out last week? Of course not. It, it didn't even exist. Can you travel back to the 1800s and, and teach someone how to use their iPhone? Of course not. There's no iPhones back then. Obviously, you can only take action on what you know and understand from here forward. I can't change yesterday. I can't change this morning. I can't change the way I turned the phrase 60 seconds ago. What I can control is the present, and what I can plan for is the future. I can't do anything about the past. It's done. I may need to apologize for the past. I may need to make amends for the past. I certainly need to gain wisdom from the past. But the whole goal of it is acting now and taking action in the future to produce an outcome that I want from here. Now this part isn't in the essay. But this is probably just as or more important than all the rest. It's this relationship we have with ourselves. So imagine how often we make arguments to ourselves, about ourselves, that mean something to us, about us, where we're breaking this fundamental rule. Where we are arguing for a proposition to ourselves, about ourselves, where the extent to which we convince ourselves that it's true means we will lose everything that's really important to us. Anyone ever do that? If everyone's raising their hands about doing it, that would be everybody, right? All of us have had those moments where we've been upset 
and we say something to ourselves about ourselves, possibly just entirely in our own heads, where we mess up and go, ugh, what's wrong with me? Or something bad happens and go, ugh, why does this always happen to me? I mean, it's you know, funny sometimes because as much as I know the brain works this way, you know, you try to capture the way it works and, and point it in the direction you want it to go. And so for me, whenever there's a solution to a problem, I'm like, ah, of course, it figures there's a solution to the problem. Ah, why does this always happen to me? I found my wallet. That stuff always happens to me. It figures. And, and basically what I'm doing is I'm just flipping the whole thing on its head. Because you think about the totality of your life up until this moment. How much of it has worked out? How many times have you died so far? If you're right here, right now, listening to this, that number is probably zero or pretty close to zero. I mean, there's some people who have had interesting experiences where they, they died and came back. Where the doctors were able to save them. But as far as just dying and being dead, that's zero of us. How many of you have gotten through whatever financial crisis that you've been through? That, that you didn't ultimately starve to death? How many of you got through, I mean, you just think about the totality of your history and how you feel about those moments right here, right now. But then how much drama you went through between then and now to get to the place where you were okay with it because now it's far enough in the past. I, I was just chatting with a friend of mine who wanted to, to tell me that uh, she did something with her daughter that she said is totally what I teach. And she wanted me to know. So, her daughter's phone was dying. And mom believed that, well, you just need to charge it. You just need to fully charge it. No, no, I dropped it and it's dead and all. Well, you know, mom thought that, well, you just never charge your phone all the way up. So if you always keep your phone between, you know, 10 and 25 percent, you know, that kind of messes with it. Let me check with my tech friend. Call the tech friend. Tech friend said, and what she needs to do is use an actual Apple charger on the iPhone and charge it 100%. And the dad says, no, my phone's broken. I can't afford a new phone. Her husband's arguing, say, oh, we're not giving her money for a new phone. That's it. You know, she broke this phone. She's on her own. She, she's going to have to get a cheap phone. And, and, and mom's just going, you know, I learned this thing. And let's just solve the problem. Well, this morning, the daughter's at the store. She says, my phone's broken, it won't work. And, and the tech opens up the phone, hits the button, turns it on, sees it's 100% charged now. Says, well, looks like I fixed it. Hands her back her phone. So the daughter calls mom. Says, mom, seems like my phone's okay. It just needed to be charged. I just want to let you know I'm going to try to listen to you more now. Because here's mom's basic proposition. She says, honey, are you going to solve the problem? She says, well, yes, I'm going to solve the problem. She's like, then why are you being so dramatic about it now? Just solve the problem. And mom's going to say, that was the most zen she'd been through a crisis in years. Drama all around her. And she's going, just solve the problem. And, you know, all based on the, one of the Conway Carr stories of plan A, B, C, D, E, F, G, all the way to plan M. And it's going to say, look, the, this guy I'm learning the Ohana way from, he had his car fry on the way to Las Vegas. And his internal dialogue is, solve the problem, solve the problem, solve the problem, solve the problem. Oh, we got another problem, solve that problem. Oh, that solution didn't work, so now we're on, on to plan E. Oh, now that one didn't work. Okay, we're on to plan F. Oh, that didn't work. Now we're on to plan G. So, and he didn't miss his own Las Vegas vacation. So if you don't mind, I'm not going to miss my weekend. We'll just solve your problem. And I called my tech friend, and my tech friend says, use an actual legitimately Apple charger, not, a, not an aftermarket one, not a, not a cheap, you know, $5 one, get the real Apple one and charge the phone up all the way and that should solve the problem. And so mom charged the phone up all the way and the daughter was convinced that it was broken and took it into the tech. 
and said, Genius Tech, please fix my phone. And Genius says, Turns it on. All right, let's fix it. Here you go. And then from the daughter's perspective, this is her big aha moment. This, this is why I got a phone call about this this morning. The daughter's aha moment was realizing all the stuff she was ignoring from her mom on Saturday. She just realized, I have had anxiety and argument over this issue for like 18 hours. Over something that just needed a button pushed. I just needed to push the button. Mom charged up my phone. The solution was easy. Why was I so upset? Why did I spend a day and a half in so much emotion, so much anxiety, over something that was already solved? I mean, that's the part that blew her mind. Once mom charged up her phone, the problem itself was solved. She just didn't know it was solved until the tech pushes the button. And realizing I was so upset over an already solved problem. Because I was so engrossed in the drama, I didn't even push a button. Because I was convinced that I still had a problem. So with ourselves, do not argue a proposition to you, about you, that means something to you, about you. Where winning your point with you means you lose everything that's really important to you. So I'm a big believer in love, joy, and peace. And it is amazing how much of our problems we make bigger than we really need to make them. So someone else I was talking to has been reporting to me that she's been waking up with anxiety attacks. But they're over nothing. She says it's kind of weird. It's like part of me is like, like as I'm learning all of this stuff, and because I'm coming into, I'm in lesson five of a six uh, lesson seminar series I'm teaching. And, and, and so this one was an interesting story. So one of the women in the group reports waking up with anxiety attacks over nothing. And she says, I think my, my, my body, my physiology, my biochemistry gets so used to having anxiety that it's like it has it all queued up and then I'm not using it during the day. And so, you know, it's like, I'm, I'm getting better. <clears throat> and it wakes me up and I go, Why, what's this anxiety about? Nothing. All right, well, I'm just going to go to the bathroom, get some water, go back to bed. And because there's, there's no anxious thoughts running around in her head, she just falls right back asleep. So this is weird. It's, it's almost like my, my body is learning how to not have anxiety. And you go, anxiety attack! It's like, whatever! I don't know! I go back to bed. So, so as people are learning the, these processes, it's, it's really interesting and powerful how this begins to impact our lives. So with you, about you. Within the bounds of being reasonably realistic, argue propositions with yourself, about yourself, to yourself, that mean something to you, about you that are reasonably balanced, I mean, you know, don't set yourself up as, you know, God's gift to the world, but based on fundamental grounded reality, giving yourself the benefit of the doubt that the totality of the facts allow, and that's one of the things, don't get caught up in the all or nothing, that you're either 100% hero or 100% villain. You're either God himself or you're the devil incarnate. That you're either the saint or you're the demon escaped from hell. Like, no, we're all just people. But be reasonably realistic, giving yourself the benefit of that. And think about the same benefit of that you would give your own child. And basically, you take responsibility for yourself. 
So a lot of this stuff, honestly, it's, it's much, much easier for parents because parents have a mental framework for having a place to be very careful with their words. That if a parent loves their child, the parent wants so much for their child and wants to be careful with their words with their child, wants to be careful with their behavior with their child, wants to invest in their child, wants to help their child learn and grow and be a better human being. And so for the average parent who really is connected to and loves their child, this is an easy concept to grasp. And so when I'm teaching parents, their brain goes, oh yeah, yeah, but, but I do that for my kid. They're like, good, now do that for yourself too. Like, oh. But if you don't have children, you kind of have to get it at a more abstract level. Now for those of us who may not have children of our own, but we have a place where we have that kind of responsibility. Like for those of us here who are martial arts instructors and thinking about how would I come to my students? How would I come especially to my kids' students? Good, let me come to myself that way. Let me be my own sensei and let me be my own student. And then we start to argue for propositions where winning our point means we get everything. That is really important to us. And then when we win, we win. I like winning. Now, will anyone get this down perfectly? Of course not. So here's part of the deal. If you nail that 100%, congratulations, you're perfect. If you nail that 99%, congratulations, that is a solid A+. If you nail it 95%, congratulations, solid A. 91%, A minus. So just think about it, like what's in the A level of performance? 91 to 100%. What's B level? Figure, you know, 80 to 90%. What's C level? 70 to 80%. Can you just do this better than you're doing it already? Can you learn it and do better then you're doing it already. Of course you can. What if this is a totally alien concept to you? It's like walking into the karate class and going, okay, wait, how do I make my oh, thumb on the outside? And it, Let yourself be the white belt. And then if after you're being the white belt for a while, you can be the advanced white belt, and then you can be the yellow belt, you're doing well. Then there's, I mean, oh, you, I haven't mastered it yet. That's kind of one of our running uh, jokes in class sometimes is, is we had a, a white belt student who had been doing something, I don't know, it might have been 20 minutes. And says, oh, yeah, I, I haven't really mastered this yet. Which is good. I've been doing martial arts for 47 years. I haven't really mastered it yet either. And then just get better at it. Get better at me with me, which is a great place to practice because... I, I seem to always be around me. Yeah, I, I just headed off on a, a one-week vacation on a cruise. I went by myself, and guess what? It turned out I was there, too. And so while I may not have had any interaction with hardly any of my you know, people in San Diego, and, you know, no classes to teach, none of my usual stuff, but, you know, I am still with me 24 hours a day. And so if I practice this with me... I can always practice. And then I practice it with the people I'm around the most. So I, you, know, you practice it with your spouse, practice it with uh, your kids, practice it with your siblings, practice it with your coworkers, practice it with your employees, practice it with your bosses, and just put it into practice. And even if you have times where you're not saying anything out loud, mentally rehearse these things. Like, well, what if? And mentally rehearse these things. So I do periodically mentally rehearse being angry with people because there are people who break my rules and sometimes I get really upset. And I will mentally rehearse, you know, what would, if I had said something out loud, what would have been a good way to handle that? And it's by having some of these things pre rehearse because, I mean, our brains do that anyway. Our brains pre-rehearse things we could say to someone and afterwards 
go over what we could have said. Oh, you had to come back for that. And what are we doing? We're basically, we're practicing and trying to find better ways to argue with people and put them down. Instead of practicing ways and coming up with ways to affirm people and solve problems. And what we want to do is get our brains in the habit of instantly thinking of propositions where winning our point gets us what we want. So when I had a guy threaten, I don't even remember what we were arguing about. But he, he was going to go home and get his gun and come back and shoot me. Well, why? Because I'm a martial artist and I have a reputation. So he figured, well, well, he can't like threaten to punch me or take me out or kick my butt or any of the usual stuff, right? So he was going to go shoot me. And because I already have this thinking queued up, I don't like, you're not going to shoot me. You don't think I'm mad enough to shoot Like, no, you are too much of a man to do something so silly. You cannot possibly tell me that you got yourself a gun that you keep in your house for the purpose of shooting at people you disagree with over an issue. That is not what men do, and that's not what mature human beings do. And you are a good human being who I'm sure got that gun for self-protection, not for purposes of murder. Okay, well, yeah. Instantly solved. What if I had gone the other way? What if what this escalating issue had gone, oh yeah, you wouldn't shoot me. You're not man enough to shoot me. You couldn't shoot me to save your own life. You even try, I'm going to kick. Okay, well now what's going to happen? Now he's going to go home, he's going to get his gun because now I put his ego on the line. But because I already had this thinking queued up and this was like 30 years ago. I mean, I certainly wasn't the martial arts instructor I was now. I would never be in that argument now. But what was I doing? I was making an argument. Argument is you're too much of a man. Proposition. Going and getting your gun over an argument is silly. You're too much of a man to do something so silly. What if I win my argument? I'm good. What if I argue the other way? And then I win my argument. I'm going to get shot. That'd be insane. But I have seen families end over ego because propositions get argued in the middle of a situation. And sooner or later, it's the last time. Father and son. And I don't know the, the truth of this story or not, but I certainly know the power of the story. Got in an argument, as fathers and sons sometimes do. Father said something that fathers sometimes very stereotypically say, like, if you walk out that door, don't you ever come back. Well, in the middle of argument, what does teenage son do? Walks out that door. And he realizes once he slams that door behind him, he was just told to never come back. Proposition. Won the point. Lost everything. As the years went on, the father really regretted what he had said. But the son was gone. And the way the story was told to me is that, that's a very old story. That the father figured that a young man that age must have gone to the big city looking for opportunity because you know, where else is an 18, 19 year old man going to go? And he went looking around every place he thought his son might go. Couldn't find his son. So he took out an ad in the paper, calling out his son by name, saying, all is forgiven. Please meet me at the cathedral. Signed, Papa. 
And that shows up at the cathedral on the appointed date and time. And hundreds of young men with that name showed up, all hoping it had been their father. Now, like I said, I don't know how true the story is, but it's supposed to be from somewhere between the 1400s and the 1600s, which just illustrates that this whole thing that we do, it's all too human. It's nothing new. That means the force of history and the force of culture builds this into us and sustains us in this bad behavior. So if we're going to be better, we have to choose to be better. Anytime you have something that culture supports that you really want to have different in your life, you have to choose the different. You have to decide what it is, decide why it is for you, figure out how you are going to do it. How does this look when you do this? So that we can start to make arguments for propositions where winning is winning. I, I, I like winning. We're going to get upset. We're going to have problems. I would love for us to argue for love instead of argue for hate. I would love for us to argue for joy rather than argue for misery. I would love for us to argue for peace rather than argue for conflict. And then we can live life with so much more bliss. So let's flip this. Do argue for propositions where winning your point means you win everything that's important to you. Just say that one two more times as we wrap up. Do argue for propositions where winning your point means you win everything that is really important to you. And one last time so you can double check and make sure you've got it down. Do argue for propositions where winning your point means you win everything that's really important to you. And that's when we can live our lives of love and live our lives of joy and live our lives of peace. Where winning is winning and we get the life and the love that we ache for and crave. And we can embrace all of this. We can be all of this. With the people that are most important to our lives and with ourselves. God bless you all.